You're listening ad-free on Wondery Plus. A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. Back in 1978, The Dating Game was still a popular TV show, even after more than a decade on the air. It was fun, kind of cheesy. I watched it while I was living in California in the 60s and 70s, way before I became an FBI agent. I remember the host signed off each episode with, this is Jim Lang saying bye-bye, and we hope you always get the date you really want. I also remember he blew lots of kisses. Anyway, the series format was simple, and it hasn't really changed much, even with the recent reboot. But a September 1978 episode remains endlessly fascinating for true crime fans. It featured a bachelorette named Cheryl. She posed the requisite flirty, provocative questions to three single men hidden from her view. She mulled over their clever responses, then chose one lucky guy to take out on a date. Since decisions were based only on the bachelor's witty answers, She relied on the banter between them to gauge any chemistry. No physical attraction, no visual cues. To those of us watching at home, it all appeared so safe. It wasn't like meeting a complete stranger. You had a live studio audience and a casting director who vetted the contestants. But all was not as it seemed, because bachelor number one, a guy with longish brown curly hair, laughing, smiling, trying very hard to charm the studio audience with provocative answers like, I'm called the banana and I look really good, was Rodney Alcala, a man with a very disturbing past. But in that moment, he seemed like a regular guy. It was not until the next day when The Bachelorette called the show's producers and told them she did not want to go out with their date because, according to her, he was too creepy and he was rude to everyone backstage. But what no one knew while watching that episode was that seven years before his national TV debut, Rodney Alcala was a top tenor. That's FBI jargon for anyone on the top 10 most wanted fugitives list. They were also not aware he'd served two prison terms for child molestation or that he had raped and murdered many, many women and had almost killed an eight-year-old girl. Even when I take into account the era when he committed many of his crimes and how tracking a felon has evolved since then, I still marvel at how Rodney Alcala moved through society with such ease and for so long and how he hid his true self so well from almost everyone. From Wondery and Tree Fort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've interviewed all kinds of criminals over the course of my careers, and the question of why they did it is what we ask time and time again, but we rarely get a satisfying answer. So I'm diving deep into the mindset of murderers and others whose disturbing behavior landed them in the news. We're going beyond the headlines here, and I'll give you my best analysis of what made them do what they did. This episode is The Dating Game Killer. About four years after I became an FBI agent, I studied crime scene analysis, aka profiling, at the Bureau's Behavioral Science Unit. Our coursework was intense and consisted of studying horrible crime scenes of innocent people who died violent deaths. Most of the victims were women and children. In order to understand why a killer kills, we look for clues in the crime scene as to their motive. We examine in excruciating detail the evidence, the autopsy report, the crime scene photos, 
anything and everything available to help us form a lifestyle and personality sketch or profile of the unknown offender. Ideally, that profile can point investigators in the right direction and not waste time on people who likely had nothing to do with it. Rodney Alcala was elusive and smart, very smart. He committed a lot of horrifying crimes before he was finally caught. But I'm going to start with his first known victim. Imagine an eight-year-old girl walking to school along the famed Sunset Boulevard in West Hollywood, California. It was 1968. A car pulled over and offered her a ride. She knew better than to talk to strangers, but when this seemingly kind man said just the right thing, that he was not a stranger and that he knew her parents, she let her guard down and climbed inside his car. A good Samaritan noticed her get in the car and thought, that seems suspicious. So he followed the car back to a nearby apartment building and called the LA police to report what he had seen. When the cops arrived and knocked on his front door, he opened it, but just a crack. The officer who stood face to face with Alcala that day said in a news interview decades later, I will always remember that face at that door. Very evil face. I think it's important to point out that he did not appear panicked as the police stood at his front door, while just behind him lay a bloodied and motionless little girl. We'll get into this more in a bit, but it is indicative of what I call C3, cool, calm, collected. There's a reason why psychopaths are so C3 when things go sideways, because psychopaths don't feel fear the way the rest of us do. Most people see a cop in their rearview mirror and their pulse goes wild, even though they're not doing anything wrong. For a psychopath, their pulse doesn't even go up a bit when they're in danger of being caught. They are able to plan on the fly without emotion interfering. The cops had to kick Rodney's door open to get into the apartment. That's where they found the little girl on the floor. She'd been strangled with a steel rod and raped. The police originally thought she was dead, but she had miraculously survived. Rodney Alcala, however, evaded capture by slipping into a back alley. From there, he was gone. The little girl's body wasn't the only important clue the police found in the apartment. There were lots of photos of young girls and a school ID. It revealed that the then 25-year-old Rodney Alcala was enrolled at UCLA. Now they had a name to go with the suspect. This vicious crime against a child landed him on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list in 1969. But despite that notoriety, he was able to travel undetected across the country. Remember, in the late 60s and early 70s, we did not have the kinds of forensic tools we do now, nor 24-7 TV coverage of such crimes. So eventually he made it to Manhattan, where he enrolled at NYU. By then, he had ditched his given name and was calling himself John Berger. Manhattan was probably the farthest big city from Los Angeles that he could get to. I think he went there so that he could hide in plain sight, just blend with everybody else. I suspect he knew he was on the FBI's most wanted list because he probably sought out coverage of his crimes. Killers do this sometimes because it makes them feel good seeing their name in print that the cops are looking for them but can't find them. They like knowing that they caused chaos somewhere. He moved throughout the city without attracting unwanted attention. He made friends and easily preyed on young women. He told them he was a photographer, a fashion photographer, whatever he needed to say to convince them that he should take their picture. He was thought to be attractive, and he used his charm to put the girls at ease. He'd point to the fancy camera around his neck. Sometimes he'd show off a portfolio filled with photographs. It was all the tricks he used to enhance his deceptions, conning the women into falling for his ruse over and over and over again. He was very slick. And let me tell you, coming from me, that is not a compliment. If someone is slick, they trick people. They fool others. They're slippery, like oil. It was later discovered that while he was in New York in 1971, he raped and strangled a young flight attendant in her apartment. 
but that was not immediately pegged to him. He was still a free man. And so John Berger, a.k.a. Rodney Alcala, got himself hired as a counselor at an all-girls camp in New Hampshire. Although it is shocking that a sex offender and killer of women would end up working at an all-girls summer camp, it's very common for this to happen. Sex abusers or child molesters never stop thinking about how to get their next victim. These guys don't take a break. It's always on their mind. So the best place for them to work is a place where they can have free range to pick their next victims. It's all about access, access, access. Fortunately, two young female campers recognized his face from a poster they'd seen of the FBI's 10 most wanted list, and they alerted the authorities. It is very unusual for people to do that, to contact the authorities about anything. Most people just go about their business. I really commend these girls for telling someone. Because of what the girls did, he was arrested in August of 1971 and sent back to California, where he was charged with the rape and assault of the eight-year-old girl from a few years before. Because of the leniency of the court at the time, he was allowed to plead guilty to a far lesser crime of child molestation. He was convicted and sentenced to one year to life, a policy at the time called indeterminate sentencing. He was paroled in less than three years because the prevailing thought at the time was the prison could rehabilitate rapists through education and psychotherapy. Decades later, the police working the case remarked that he had charmed the prison psychiatrist just like he charmed his victims. This got him back on the streets to prey on more young women. And that is exactly what he did. This is not unusual among serial killers. While out on parole, he got arrested a again for kidnapping a minor girl and offering her drugs. So here he is out on parole and committing a major violation again. That speaks to the compulsive nature of these types of offenders. They know that they shouldn't do it intellectually, but emotionally, they choose to do it. They choose to do bad. They choose to do wrong because it makes them feel good. They indulge their fantasies and their fantasies are horrific. So back to prison he went, but he was only convicted for violating his parole. And that should have been the end of his freedom for the rest of his life. Remember, his sentence was one year to life, but that didn't happen. Yes, despite being a registered child rapist, a convicted sexual predator, and a flight risk, he was back on the streets, a free man. Perhaps the parole board didn't think he looked like a sex offender, after all, He was good-looking, and sometimes good-looking people get away with murder. Research has borne out that when good-looking people get away with crimes, it can be explained by the halo effect, the halo effect of attractiveness. We have a tendency to unconsciously assign to attractive people favorable traits, such as they're talented or they're kind or they're honest, and they may be none of those things. In fact, they could be a killer. By 1977, he'd murdered a beautiful nightclub heiress. Although she was only thought to be missing for quite some time before her body was found in the woods outside New York City. Since he was not a suspect in this woman's disappearance or death, at the time, he was able to continue floating from place to place. In the summer of 1977, he murdered a pregnant woman in a very remote area of Wyoming. But that death was not connected to him for nearly 40 years. Not surprisingly, he took a photo of her sitting on his motorcycle. She was smiling lovingly at him. He took the picture shortly before he killed her. Rodney Alcala was hiding in plain sight, walking amongst us, working beside us. He went back to Los Angeles and was hired by the LA Times as a typesetter, a position he got without a thorough background check. Obviously, a simple one would have uncovered his felony convictions and prison stints even back then. In Wondery's The Dating Game Killer podcast, Rodney was described as being really friendly with his colleagues there, often entertaining them with stories about celebrity parties he'd gone to. But his predatory ways were a constant. He was chatting up women in their early teens to their mid-20s with an alarming frequency. 
His predation only stopped when he slept. Many of those he convinced to get into his car were assaulted, but he didn't always kill his victims. One survivor, a 15-year-old hitchhiker, was knocked unconscious with a tree branch, but lived to tell her story. And that resulted in yet another arrest for kidnapping and rape. By the way, it's not uncommon for serial killers to occasionally spare a victim. According to the FBI, once the killers start killing sequentially, they don't always kill every victim. It happens. Either the victim struck an emotional chord with them, maybe reminded them of someone that they like, and they decide to let them live. His mother posted his bail, and it was while he was out on that bail in 1979 that he claimed another young victim, a 12-year-old girl with long blonde hair riding her bike to ballet class in Huntington Beach, California. Her body was discovered 12 days later in a remote area 40 miles or so from where she was last seen. And that location was not at all far from where Alcala was living with the mother who had bailed him out. An old CBS news story I watched on this case had an interview with his then-girlfriend. She recalled they'd gone away for a weekend together when that 12-year-old girl was murdered. To her, he was the same sweet, smart, funny Rodney she was dating. Nothing indicated to her that he was living a murderous double life. But she didn't know where he was on the day of the girl's disappearance. And it turned out, he did not have an alibi. The investigators working the case pieced together evidence, including a sketch of the killer. They obtained this from an eyewitness account from her best friend. They were playing on the beach together, and that's when Alcala approached them and asked if he could take their picture. They agreed, and when the soon-to-be victim went to leave, the 12-year-old eyewitness became nervous and offered her her bike. She said she had a bad feeling about the photographer and wanted her friend to get to dance class safely. And that was the last time the little girl was seen alive. Because of his previous arrest and interactions with the police, Alcala was on the cops' radar. When they added in the composite sketch that looked very similar to him and his proximity to the crimes, Rodney Alcala became a very strong suspect. He was eventually arrested, tried, and convicted of first-degree murder. He received the death penalty. However, the conviction was overturned on the grounds that Alcala did not receive a fair trial, namely that the jury was prejudiced against him because they'd learned of his past crimes. As incredible as that sounds, that is what happened. Defendants are tried only on the facts of that case, not prior bad acts. But for more than a decade before he was taken into custody, he crisscrossed America, that camera strung around his neck, stalking, assaulting, and murdering more women than we may ever know. So what was his motivation? Sex? Power? Some misplaced need for revenge? How did a serial kidnapper, rapist, and murderer fool so many people for so many years into thinking he was just a normal, charming guy? Rodney Alcala's charming smile and easygoing facade was in stark contrast to who he truly was. But at what point in his life was this first apparent? It's hard to say because not much is known about his early years. But what we do know is that his childhood was not exactly idyllic. When Rodney was 11, his father abandoned him, his mother and his two sisters. This kind of desertion can have long-term psychological effects on people. Studies have shown children dealing with this situation in which there is both physical and emotional abandonment feel unwanted and unloved. They frequently feel that they push that parent away. The child does not understand why they were left behind. They feel discarded. As a result, they can be prone to bouts of self-loathing. There are a lot of emotional difficulties rooted in this, including anxiety disorders, attachment disorders, and clinical depression. Children who were deserted by a parent as adults frequently suffer from self-esteem issues. They don't feel they're worth anything. 
While he was grappling with the profound loss of his father, his mother moved the family from San Antonio to Los Angeles, so he lost all his friends as well. What are the two worst things that can happen to a little kid? Losing a parent and losing their friends. He graduated high school and at 17, he joined the army. He had dreams of becoming a paratrooper. To me, that's very interesting. It's a sign that he was drawn to excitement, adrenaline rushes. He was a thrill seeker. What does a paratrooper do? They rescue people and they are widely regarded as heroes. But Rodney was not hero material. It's been reported that he suffered some sort of nervous breakdown. This is a generic term, and we don't know exactly what was going on in Alcala's case. But around this time, he was noted to be a sexual deviant and was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder by the Army psychiatrist. What is that? Well, it's a personality disorder characterized by an absolute inability to feel any empathy at all for any living thing. It's also sometimes referred to as psychopathy or sociopathy. Those with it have no regard for right and wrong or the rules of society. They have no remorse for anything they do, and they do not feel guilt for anything they do. That's what makes it easy for them to hurt other people. Other common symptoms or traits of these types of people include being superficially charming. They love to manipulate. They love to lie. In fact, they will lie when the truth is easier. Why? Because they love to pull the wool over someone else's eyes. That makes them feel good. Typically, those with antisocial personality disorder first start showing signs when they are very young, four, five, six years old. The exact cause is not known, but it's believed to be a combination of genetics or one's environment. Some risk factors include abuse, neglect, and a chaotic home life. And FBI research of serial killers revealed that most of them come from very challenging backgrounds. I believe a combination of his genes, the haunting abandonment of his dad, and other childhood incidents we are unaware of were at play with Rodney Alcala. But it's important to note that serial killers develop over time. It is not one triggering event that changes everything. You do not snap and become a serial killer. In Rodney's case, it's generally thought that he did not begin killing until he fled L.A. for New York. But I'm not willing to concede that. We do not have information about prior assaults. I think it was his intention to kill the eight-year-old girl in West Hollywood, and he just got stopped before he could finish. This tells me that he was already thinking and behaving this way before he went out east. According to FBI research into serial killers, the first time that a sexually motivated killer commits a crime, it's not pre-planned, but rather spontaneous. These guys commit these crimes in fantasy long before they get to their actual first murder victim. And the more bold the abduction, such as grabbing a kid off the street or a witnessed abduction, the quicker the victim is raped and murdered. Why? because the killer was sloppy. He could have been seen. If he's committed to the assault, if he's committed to the murder, he has to act fast. So if the eight-year-old girl were his first, then that would make sense here. It appeared to be impulsive. His belongings were all over his apartment. He picked her up in broad daylight on a city street, seemingly without a care in the world as to who saw him. Then he tortured her and raped her. The police who saved her literally thought she was dead. But here's the thing. We have to remember that he never imagined he would get caught. Something we see in a lot of psychopaths is narcissism. A narcissist thinks they are perfect and cannot make any errors. Rodney Alcala was definitely a narcissist, so it could have been that he was being careless and didn't consider that he would get caught instead of this just being his first kill. Was he a sadist? I believe he was. A sexual sadist? Yes. And here's why. One of the things we learned about Alcala is that he would strangle his victims until they were on the brink of death, then revive them and do it again. A lot of rapists tell us that the screaming and the fear on their face turns them on. They become sexually aroused in response to the extreme pain and suffering that they are causing the victim. And that is a sexual sadist. It is a myth that sadists hurt people because they like to hurt people. 
In fact, what they really like, what they really enjoy, is the suffering of the person they hurt. By prolonging his victim's suffering, he enjoyed himself. This is what satisfied him. It was less about killing and more about literally having someone's life in his hands. For the sadist, once the victim is dead, the party's over. So they prolong the assault. I've been asked, why would a sexually motivated serial killer of adult women attack a child? And the answer is, when these guys are in what I call murder mode, they've been fantasizing, they get aroused, they want to go out and do it. And if they cannot find a suitable adult target, but they see a female child, she becomes the unlucky victim. And that's what happened here. Alcala didn't just strangle and rape his victims. He unleashed unbridled animal savagery on them by beating and biting them. When you combine his sexual sadism with his antisocial personality disorder, for instance, his lack of empathy and poor impulse control, you have a very dangerous individual on the loose. And he was permitted to be on the loose because the state of California believed he'd been rehabilitated. The prevailing policy at the time was when someone served their time, they would be released back into society. It didn't matter what they'd done to get to prison in the first place. The phrase was, they've paid their debt to society. But I can tell you as a psychiatric nurse, I treated a lot of patients who were abused and raped, and their suffering never ends. Can someone be cured of the urges that Rodney Alcala had? No. They were way more than just urges. They were woven into the fabric of who he was. As a young man, the fantasies of violence got mixed with sexual urges, and after that, the damage was done. The only way to treat these people so that they won't do it again is to keep them behind bars so they don't have access to victims. Research has shown that when these offenders are in treatment, they frequently violate as soon as they're released on parole especially child offenders. The only hope was for him to remain behind bars so that society was safe. That was not hope for him. That was hope for society. Serial killers indulge their fantasies. They act on them. The police also noticed that he liked to play games with them. In fact, when police interviewed him, they noted that sometimes he'd pretend to be asleep, and other times he would take his finger and trace the victim's bodies on the photos in front of him. That kind of game playing with the cops is the grandiosity of narcissism. I'm smarter than you are. You'll never catch me. Actually, showing him photos just allowed him to relive the events. That's why he traced the victim's bodies. When they showed him the picture of the woman in Wyoming sitting on his motorcycle, he traced her body. He was clearly reliving the fantasy. And that is the kind of guy with loads of superficial charm who'd go on national television because he believed he could manipulate the masses into seeing him as an average, even normal guy. I make this point often, I know, but many serial killers crave attention, like appearing on the dating game show and presenting himself as a successful photographer. That is how he was introduced. He was trying to create his public image, and it worked, although not necessarily the way he intended because to the public, Rodney Alcala is more commonly recognized as the dating game killer instead of the dating game winner. Let's unpack Rodney's perception of himself as a successful photographer. We know that his camera and the promise of pictures lured some victims to let their guard down. After he was arrested and police raided a storage locker he had in Seattle, they found hundreds of compromising photos of adolescent girls and boys, as well as women in their 20s. Why do serial killers keep stuff like this? In short, It prolongs the fantasy and the pleasure they get from the assault and the murder. It also helps them relive the events. I believe Alcala also kept these photos for another reason, so he could fantasize over some of his future targets without raising more suspicion. However, not all the photos were taken while his victims were alive. Alcala would often place their dead bodies in sexually explicit poses. It further fueled his fantasy life and enhanced his sexual gratification after he killed them. 
His desire to kill stemmed from the sexual fantasies he'd been nurturing since adolescence. But the photos were not the only trophies Rodney kept. When the police sifted through that storage locker, they uncovered pairs and pairs of women's earrings. It was a set of delicate gold studs that actually helped tie Rodney Alcala to the murder of the 12-year-old girl. The brutality of this little girl's murder was compounded for her family by the criminal trials they were forced to endure, and there were three of them. He was convicted of murder and sentenced to death in all three trials. But due to the first two convictions being overturned, he was granted a third trial. And because of this, her family was forced to relive her pain over and over with each trial. In 2010, Rodney Alcala had been in prison for more than three decades. By this time, the long, dark hair from his appearance on the dating game was gray and straggly. But more importantly, in the years he spent behind bars, DNA technology had caught up with him. He was found guilty of the murders of five other women in the Southern California area, all killed in the late 70s. But 2010 also marked the third and final trial Rodney Alcala faced for the 1979 murder of the 12-year-old girl. The family had been through so much. They were taunted continuously by this killer over the years. For example, during the first trial, Rodney would turn and blow kisses to the victim's mother. Why would he do that? Because for the sadist, emotional torture is as good as physical torture. But this third and final trial gave the public a closer look at Rodney Alcala's mind. He chose to represent himself in court, not an unusual serial killer move. Local news covered it extensively, which I'm sure he loved. They reported on his antics, bizarre, rambling line of questioning, laughing and talking throughout, He pretended to cross-examine himself on the witness stand and used a different, deeper voice to ask the questions. Things like, Rodney, will you please tell us about your hair? That line of questioning was meant to show the judge and jury that his hairstyle was not the same as the one in the police sketch from three decades earlier. In another attempt at manipulating the system, Alcala paid a psychiatrist $20,000 to testify on his behalf. That doctor claimed Alcala did not remember killing four other women whose deaths he'd been charged with. And this indicated to the doctor that Rodney suffered from borderline personality disorder with psychotic features, possibly triggered by stressful events. Basically, he was saying that the trauma of murdering these women caused him to have amnesia. This is laughable, and I do not agree with that diagnosis. No one knows exactly how many women and children he slaughtered before he was taken off the streets. He was convicted of seven murders, but some estimates believe his victims may number anywhere from 50 to 140. I agree, I think he killed a lot more people than just seven women. On July 24th, 2021, Rodney Alcala died in prison at the age of 77. It is now generally thought that he may have been America's most prolific serial killer. From Wondery and Treefort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Edited by Michael Schatz with Maxwell Carney. Our senior audio producer is Tom Monahan. Justin Washington is production manager, and Haley Mandelberg is production coordinator. Brandon Clark is our production assistant, and the line producer is Oscar Guido. Our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort, and Marsha Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. <laughs>